Hello everyone and welcome back to the Standard Photonics and Plasmonics course. In this second video, we're going to continue exploring uh, the possibilities of electron energy loss spectroscopy for uh, plasmonic studies. And we're also going to uh, introduce the concept of cathode luminescence. So we've seen in the previous video that you can actually use eels to probe locally localized surface plasmon resonances in metallic nanoparticles. What we've seen in the previous video was basically the capability of EELS to generate two-dimensional mappings of the local surface plasmon resonances. You can also generate three-dimensional images, uh, and the concept is basically the same. So if you have a nanoparticle, you accept the nanoparticle at a given location with an electron beam, and you basically obtain a near spectrum where you can identify the various uh, local surface plasmon modes that basically contribute to the EELS signal. Uh, once you decide which energy you want to focus on, you can basically just uh, scan the electron beam across the nanoparticle and just filter out only one given uh, energy. Uh, so if you, if you do that, you can selectively generate two-dimensional mappings uh, of loss probabilities uh, that are basically going to really represent what the plasma resonances are at given energies. And that's basically what has been done in two-dimensional cases so far. And what can be done here is basically just uh, tilt slightly the sample order where the nanoparticle is uh, by just a small amount and retake an additional scan to generate another image. And that's basically what this is about. So you have the, the nanoparticle, which is basically sitting on a, a flat uh, sample order, and then you just rotate the sample order by 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 or 60. And you can just generate successively uh, different uh, two-dimensional maps that basically going to be uh, representative of what the, the plasma resonance will be when you basically just uh, rotate the nanoparticle. And then you can just basically uh, generate some tomography from there. You can just basically generate a three-dimensional map from those different snapshots. So the, this uh, tomography generation is, uh, is very powerful because it allows you to have a three-dimensional image of uh, the localized fat plasma resonances that you have on the system. So in that case, for instance, you can see that uh, you have different uh, different plasma modes. You see that you have some modes that are basically exciting, mostly the, the, the bottom corners of the cube that are basically in contact with the substrates, while those modes are exciting predominantly the, the corners of the cube that are basically on the opposite side of the substrate, while this one excites the, the modes that are on the edges of the cube and this one on the on the faces of the cube. So this is a very powerful technique technique that has been developed in uh, in 2013. See that it's been published in Nature, uh, and that allows you to, to to provide very detailed information about the nature of the modes in complex plasmonic nanostructures. So we can wonder how those uh, loss probability maps actually compare to electric feed maps that we've been discussing so far. Uh, so this is just a simple comparison on uh, a nanorod, uh, which is just a, a nanorod with uh, just a, a void inside. So this is a hollow nanorod uh, composed of silver. And these are just experimental yields uh, maps that have been generated on one side of the, uh, the nanorod only uh, for uh, those four different plasma modes that are showing up here. Um, so this is pretty well understood. You have a plasma hybridization diagram that basically shows uh, what the modes of a cavity are, uh, what the modes of, of this nanorod uh, is, and then therefore you have the bonding and anti-bonding combinations that basically form the, the modes of this uh, void nanorod. And then you have both the transverse and the longitudinal plasma resonances. So for this particular system, you see that you have a set at least of four different modes that can coexist. Uh, and this is those, these are basically some of the modes that we have here. Um, so these are the experimental EELS measurements. These are uh, the EELS calculations uh, uh, that have been done using FDTD. And the electric field distributions. So this is the, the near field distribution of those, uh, those uh, nanoparticles calculated using just FDTD. Um, and these are the, just the induced uh, charge distributions that are basically going to highlight the nature of the mode. So uh, several things we can do we, uh, here is and comparing we can see. Uh, if you compare this mode at uh, 2.5 electron volts, so the highest energy mode, uh, so this appears to be an anti-bonding uh, transverse dipole. So we are looking at uh, this mode, which is uh, higher in energy, so transverse. Uh, you see that you have uh, negative charges on one side, you have uh, positive charges on the other side, 
and then inside in the void you have basically the opposite uh, charge so you have negative here you have positive you have negative in the void and positive on the outside um, so if you calculate the local electric field you see that basically you have those lobes that are showing up on both ends of the nano rod uh, this is something that also shows up in the calculations uh, although it does not necessarily show up very clearly in the experiments, but the calculation show up that you have a fa normally fairly similar pattern. Um, now, something which is also very important to notice is that in EOS, uh, for this second mode, which is uh, appearing to be a bonding quadrupole mode, uh, you see that you have basically loss probability, which is only on the outside of the nano road, while you have some electric fields inside the void. Uh, you see that you have some electric fields inside this at the air um, air silver interface uh, inside the void. Similar for this particular mode where it shows up that you have a strong signal from the outside but no signal from the inside. Uh, and this is something which is opposite to what uh, the electric field map is. So in this case, if you look at the electric field induced by the plasmon for this particular resonance, uh, you have basically strong electric field inside the void and very small field on the outside. So this is uh, somehow counterintuitive. So it looks like that there's some type of uh, relationship between electric field and loss probability, but it's not a one-on-one -on -one, uh, matching. So in fact, if you compare uh, different physical quantity, you can see actually the, the similarities. So uh, what this figure is comparing is basically the loss probability, which is uh, what is probed using EELS with the uh, local electric near field uh, with the local density of photonic states and the scalar electric potential uh, for both a bonding mode for a dimer of disk and an anti-bonding dipole uh, of a dimer of disk. Um, so you can see that, for instance, the EELS, which is on this uh, part of the panel, so you have the EELS uh, bonding mode, you have the EELS anti-bonding mode. Um, you see that this basically correlates very well with what you, uh, you can see for the scalar electric potential uh, for both the bonding and anti-bonding. So if you're looking at the anti-bonding, you see they have a uh, strongly positive uh, electric potential in the gap, and that's where you're going to have the strong loss probability. For the bonding mode, you see that you have positive and negative, so it's going to be cancelling out, and you see that you have no loss probability. If you compare that to the electric field, this is basically the lower panel here, that now you have a strong electric field for this bonding mode in the gap, uh, so the yields you see that doesn't show anything. So the local electric field and uh, the loss probability are not basically matching one on one. So the electric field matches more the, the distribution of the local density of optical state. Uh, and this is the same for the for the anti-bonding. So you see that if you have an anti-bonding dipole mode, uh, you're gonna have electric fields on the on the outside of the particle. You're gonna have basically no field in the gap. Uh, which is opposite to what you see in the EELS, but on the other end, the LDOS uh, give you a similar distribution with basically no LDOS in the gap and therefore no field. So uh, you have four different quantities that all relate to each other because the electrostatic potential is basically responsible for giving you some local electric field, which also correlates to the local density of state, and therefore it's going to be somehow connected to the, uh, to the loss probability because you're exciting plasmons but it's not necessarily a one-on-one -on -one, uh, correlation. And therefore, uh, it's uh, important to, uh, to highlight that the loss probability uh, will be more correla correlated to the scalar electric uh, potential, while the electric field will be more correlated to the local uh, density of optical states. So that's basically the, the main takeaway. So you, uh, experimentally, people have, uh, that are doing EELS uh, cannot necessarily compare one-on-one -on -one with local uh, electric field distributions. Uh, although there's some type of relationship, it's not a direct correlation. Uh, another type of uh, uh, process that can be actually uh, important when you have uh, high electron uh, beams that are interacting with matter is basically light emission process. Um, and light emission process with swift electron can take various forms. So this is just a, a short list of the type of uh, generation mechanisms that you get uh, when you have high velocity electrons impacting on, on, on matter in general. Um, so going from uh, electron-induced radiation emission, uh, which are just far-field radiations um, that are basically coherent with those uh, incident evanescent field from the electrons, 
Um, you can have some incoherent uh, light emission process, which is called cathode luminescence, uh, which is just uh, coming from the electron or pair uh, that are basically recombining in the material once the, they have been excited using uh, those high velocity electrons. And that's what we're going to be discussing in, in a minute. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, at the beginning of the, pre the first video that we can have transition radiations or Cherenkov radiations, uh, and you have also diffraction radiations. Uh, so these are different processes that occur every time you have high velocity electrons. Uh, the one that is of interest for us is, of course, this cathode luminescence, uh, which comes from the, the radiative recombination of electrons and all pairs that have been excited uh, by the high velocity electron in, uh, from the, the microscope. Uh, so what does uh, cathodominescence uh, give you? Uh, what's the difference between this and, and EELS? So cathodominescence is just another um, electron-induced light emission process, um, and it's just another way to probe uh, plasmonic properties uh, in uh, nanostructures. Uh, so it's just sending high velocity electrons, and then you just collect the, the light, which is being re-emitted by the, the nanostructures after the, uh, the electron beam excitation. And you can just basically collect the same uh, same type of information. So you can collect a, 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 a spectrum. Uh, we're basically going to show you a uh, different type of mode. So you, uh, you you have this experimental data for this particular silver nanoparticle. So you see it's a very large nanoparticle. Uh, it's 150 nanometers in size. So retardation effects are very uh, important. That's why you have the dipole resonance here and you have the quadrupole resonance uh, that are, is also showing up. You can do very similarly to EELS, uh, you can also do uh, two-dimensional mappings and this is simply because you can uh, excite locally, so if you excite locally a nanoparticle you can collect the, the photons that are coming out from that particular uh, excitation and generate uh, a cathode luminescence map. So that's the, the power of this over just regular optical spectroscopy is that you can also have this local uh, excitation and therefore generate those, uh, those uh, two-dimensional maps. So you can, in that case for instance, map this dipolar plasma resonance uh, of this nanoparticle. And you can do the, the same for, uh, for all the type of modes you have in this, uh, in this type of system, so polypores or two poles. Um, so this is just an example of a uh, cathode luminescence map that you, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do. Uh, this is for uh, gold uh, nanorods of different aspect ratios, going from just a, a single, uh, single particle to something uh, which basically elongates uh, to a very long nanowire. And you see that you can really image the, the dipole resonance uh, of those different different modes, and then you can even probe higher other modes uh, as you increase the aspect ratio. Uh, very similarly to EELS, uh, you can generate uh, basically not only two-dimensional cathode luminescence map, uh, but also three-dimensional cathode luminescence map by just uh, doing the same type of, of tilt you have. Uh, so you can just uh, take a succession uh, of uh, of rotation uh, angles image the cathode luminescence and then by uh, basically uh, sophisticated algorithms you can generate a three-dimensional tomography uh, which basically really illustrate uh, what the plasmon modes are uh, in three dimensions. Here you're just imaging the photon emission from uh, from those uh, those modes while in EELS you're just imaging the loss probability distribution. Um, so how do things compare? How do you actually compare cathode luminescence with EELS, with uh, optical spectroscopy? So basically, with optical spectroscopy, so something we've been discussing uh, since the very beginning, uh, basically you send photon in the structure uh, and then basically you collect photon out of the structure. So it's basically photon in, photon out, it's all optical. Uh, so because you send photon in, uh, you can only excite the bright modes and because you detect uh, photons, you can only detect uh, the, the modes that are basically emitting photons, so only the bright modes. So all the higher order modes, quadrupoles, octopoles that are not radiative because uh, uh, the size is too small and they don't emit light, will not be able to, uh, to be observed in optical spectroscopy. So in the case of uh, cathode luminescence, for instance, uh, you send electrons in. Uh, so because you, are, you have the electrons that basically excite the structure, you'll be able to excite both bright and dark modes. Uh, with respect to, uh, to, to optical excitation, that's a big improvement. But on the other hand, because you de still detect photons, uh, you will be able to, uh, to detect only the photons that emit light. So the excitation of the dark modes, uh, to some extent, is basically useless in that particular scenario because you will not be able to actually observe them. Uh, on the other hand, because you have a, a localized uh, probe, you can also achieve very high spatial resolution. So you cannot only excite the entire structure, you can excite 
specific points on the structure and generate those two-dimensional maps. So this is the big improvement over optical spectroscopy. You can, you can do this uh, very high spatial resolution imaging of the plasma modes. And finally, EELS, uh, that's basically the top uh, technique. Uh, you send those electrons in, collect the electrons uh, now on the way out. So you're able to excite both bright and dark modes, but you can also detect the, both of them. So this is the big advantage over cathode luminescence is that now you can detect the, br the, the bright and dark modes uh, using EELS because you're not detecting only photons. You're detecting uh, the interaction of those dark modes with uh, the impacting electrons. Uh, so you have both uh, high spectral and uh, spatial resolution. You can generate those very nice uh, electron beam, uh, electron uh, losses uh, distributions. Uh, so you have, of course, uh, higher resolution in EELS than cathode luminescence. And this is basically due to the fact that we have higher velocity electrons uh, in EELS than in cathode luminescence. So um, basically that uh, concludes this, uh, this chapter. Uh, so we've discussed different, uh, different points on electron-based spectroscopy. Uh, so we discussed about this uh, concept of inelastic electron scattering, uh, which is giving you the, the yields, uh, the light emission process uh, from cathode luminescence. Uh, we discussed about the yields specifically and how we can selectively excite low class plasma modes, both bright and dark modes. Um, and I actually, actually can uh, provide uh, spatial imaging uh, of those low class surface plasma modes, both in two dimension and also even three, three dimension now. Uh, the same for cathode luminescence. Uh, it has the power to selectively excite plasmons, but it can only probe bright modes. Uh, but uh, the advantage is that because you have this local excitation, like in EELS, you can also uh, generate uh, two dimensional and even three dimensional. Uh, mappings of those uh, local surface plasma modes. And we just uh, discussed as well uh, the relationship between uh, four key uh, properties of four key physical uh, quantities that are the loss probability, which is measured in yields, which correlates to the scalar electric potential. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, the local electric field we've been discussing so far that directly connects to the to the photonic uh, local density of the state. So once again, all those four quantities are all related to each other. But if you really want to compare on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, I think something which is really uh, very equivalent. Uh, this is uh, the comparison you need to make.